the session. Hi, everyone. Welcome to everyone who's tuning in for the 2022-1455 Summer Festival. And for those who may be watching at a later date, welcome. My name is Jani Rindawa. I am the program director of the Unicorn Authors Club, which I will speak a little bit more about later. And I'm joined today by amazing panelists, Suna Chandi, Jen Soriano, and Lauren Taylor. For our panel today, Book Deal Magic, Taking Your Unicorn to the Racetrack. I'm very excited to be here with y'all today. Thank you so much for joining us. Oops. I just moved on very quickly into our <laughs> into the slideshow. Um, I want to share what you expect from us today during our panel. Our panel is going to be about an hour long and is going to be split into five parts that kind of fluidly overlap with each other. Um, so we'll have a panel framing and a framing of the Unicorn Authors Club. We'll introduce our inimitable panelists. We'll have rapid readings a moderated conversation, and then a very brief closing and sharing of resources together. So through a combination of readings, um, panelist discussion, and the link that I was just speaking to that is part of our resource sharing, um, we'll share resources to inspire and hopefully encourage all of those who are viewing along the sometimes arduous and winding journey toward writing a book and landing a book deal. The panelists, Sunu Chandi, Jen Soriano, and Lauren Taylor are all members of a virtual community, the Unicorn Authors Club, and have supported one another over the past two years throughout the process of writing and publishing their books. Their books represent a mix of agented and non-agented manuscripts from major presses and small indie presses, as well as a mix of genres. Their work spans poetry, essay, and practical nonfiction. So before we move forward, uh, if viewers have any questions about this panel or questions for the panelists, please feel free to email me, Johnny, at hello at unicornauthors.club. This email address can be found at the bottom of these slides that I'll share in light gray text. So before we dig into our panel, I want to frame what the Unicorn Authors Club is. What is the Unicorn Authors Club? The Unicorn Authors Club is a virtual community with a mission to holistically support BIPOC and dedicatedly allied authors in finishing their book projects. Founded by journalist, author, and writing coach Nino Hadrakwala, the Unicorn Authors Club emerged amidst the multiple pandemics of 2020 and has already worked with over 70 writers, several of whom have received book contracts and completed manuscripts. Three of those authors are here with us today. On a personal level, I started with the Unicorn Authors Club as community facilitator, opening Zoom rooms for writers to check in and co-write with each other. And there I had the privilege of hanging out with and learning from the wisdom of our wonderful panelists. Now as program director of the Unicorn Authors Club, I'm honored to be a, represent a representative of our community and to moderate our panel today. And you can learn more about the club, who we are, and how we support our authors at www.unicornauthors.club slash our story. So now I will begin framing our panel today, Book Deal Magic, Taking Your Unicorn to the Racetrack. The publishing industry can feel like a racetrack. I just want to share that I'm reading kind of a script. So if it seems very uh, wooden, <laughs> that's just my terrible performance. Um, but this is kind of the script that we have um, and how we'll be framing our conversation today. So the pub publishing industry can feel like a racetrack in which writers are prize forces engaged in sweaty competition. There are clear winners and losers, and owners and onlookers gamble on who will make it big. For racialized and otherwise marginalized authors, too often this manifests as a scarcity model where we are pitted against one another, with rejections framed as 
we already have one of quote unquote those on our list. There's a quota system. But the creative process we feel is better served not by trying to game the system. Writers write better when cultivating their own unique vision, strengths, story, and voice. And I personally believe writers write better and build better literary community when they're actively considering how their writing and their processes engage in anti-racist, gender affirming, and decolonial modalities. The panelists here are deeply engaged in that work and, are, and have successfully crossed over and will share wisdom about what happens when, as writers deeply engaged also in internal work throughout this process. Um, how they made it into the submissions and publishing side of this process. Some other framing questions that we are considering in this time together is how can we as authors encourage our diverse community to lift and support each other up rather than succumb to a scarcity model and really be in that race together that I was speaking to at the beginning. What happens when you take your uniform to the racetrack? How are we actually disrupting the racetrack to transform it into a collective relay or a frolicking unicorn party instead? So I'm gonna begin now by introducing our panelists who, uh, as I said before, are inimitable and whose bios are so rich and so long that they couldn't fit on a slide. So you'll see some bullet points here. We'll begin with Sunu. Sunu P. Chandy won the 2021 Terry J. Cox Poetry Award from Regal House for her debut collection, My Dear Comrades, forthcoming in 2023. Sunu is a social justice activist through her work as a civil rights attorney and a poet. She is the daughter of immigrants from Kerala, India, and currently lives in Washington, DC with her family. She serves as the legal director for the National Women's Law Center and leads litigation and provides guidance on policy work in the areas of workplace justice and LGBTQ rights. She serves on the board of the Transgender Law Center and was included as one of the 2021 Queer Women of Washington. Sunu is a graduate of Northeastern Law School and Arlen College, where she majored in Women's Studies and Peace and Global Studies. Sunu completed her MFA in poetry at Queens College City University of New York in 2015. Sunu's work can be found in publications including Asian American Literary Review, Beltway Poetry Quarterly, Poets on Adoption, Split This Rocks Online Social Justice Database, The Quarry, and in anthologies including The Penguin Book of Indian Poets, The Long Devotion, Poets Writing Motherhood, and this bridge we call home, Radical Visions for Transformation. You can connect with Sunu on Twitter, at Sunu Chink. Our next panelist is Jen Soriano. Jen Soriano is a Filipino American writer, performer, and social movement strategist living on Duwamish territory in Seattle. She is the author of Nervous Essays, a collection that uses personal experiences as a window into the science of how trauma becomes embodied, transmitted, and transformed over generations. It is her first book and is forthcoming from HarperCollins Amistad in 2023. Jen is also the author of the chapbook Making the Tongue Dry, which was a finalist for the Cut Bank, Newfound, and Gazing Grain chapbook prizes. Melissa Phoebos has called Jen's work powerful and luminous and chose her essay on broken water as winner of the 2019 Penelope C. Niven Prize for the Cent from the Center for Women Writers. Aisha Sabatini Sloan chose her essay Warfire as winner of the 2019 Few Prose Prize, calling her work vivid and cinematic. Jen was a prose finalist in the 2019 Plowshares Emerging Writers Contest, a poet in residence with Washington Physicians for Social Responsibility, and has received fellowships from the Vermont Studio Center, Hugo House, and Jack Jones Literary Arts Retreat. Jen is also the author of Multiplicity from the Margins, published by Assay, a journal of nonfiction studies, 
which explores the potential of intersectional form to disrupt oppressive narratives and expand narrow worldviews. Jen holds a BA in history and science from Harvard and an MFA from the Rainier Writing Workshop at Pacific Lutheran University. She wants whatever you are eating now and would love to connect on Instagram at Jen Soriano Writes or on Twitter at Lions Write. And our final panelist for today is Lauren Taylor. Lauren R. Taylor is co-author of Get Empowered, a practical guide to thrive, heal, and embrace your confidence in a sexist world. An illustrated workbook for those most likely to be targeted for gender-based violence. That is LGBTQIA plus people and cis women. She and her co-author are trailblazers in the field of empowerment self-defense. The book is forthcoming in 2023 from Karcher Paragui, a Penguin Random House imprint. Lauren founded or co-founded numerous organizations, including Washington DC's first shelter for abused women and their children, Washington DC's first march to stop violence against women, the Lesbian Health and Counseling Center, Defend Yourself, Empowerment Self-Defense Training, for those, oops, I've lost my place, give me one second. Sorry about that. Um, so Lauren has also co-founded, founded Defend Yourself, Empowered Self-Defense Training for those targeted for gender-based violence, the Professional Development Conference for Empowerment Self-Defense Practitioners, Safe Bars, Active Bystander Training for those who work in alcohol-serving establishments, the National Street Harassment Hotline, and the Empowerment Self-Defense Self Alliance. Her writing has appeared in the Washington Post, news magazine, and elsewhere. When she's not training the resistance, Lauren is usually cuddling with her cats, meditating, hiking, or making collage. You can connect with her at www.laurenrosetaylor.com, where you'll also find all of her socials. Wow. Um, I just want to say that there's so much transformative work that you were all engaged in and have pointed out in your bios. And I'm so, I'm just so honored to be here with all of you today. And your work is deeply urgent, needed right now um, in this current cultural moment in the United States in particular. And so before we move into our conversation, we're gonna have a rapid reading section. So we'll begin um, our rapid readings We'll start with Jen, move to Sunu, and conclude with Lauren. Jen, would you like to start us off? Yes, thank you, Johnny. So I'm gonna read something from my chat book, which is also gonna be in a different version, the opening essay to my uh, forthcoming collection called Nervous. So it's an excerpt from an essay called A Brief History of Her Pain. And uh, it's, it's an excerpt that um, I'll describe as pro-control over our own uteri, uteruses, however you say that word. 2013 AD. I am waiting patiently for the doctor to say something. She moves her reading glasses to the precipice of her nose and examines the gray film at arm's length. Silence. She shifts in her chair, flicks her hand so the film goes thwack and moves it upward towards a sickly fluorescent light. Your uterus is tipped, she says. And see this? She points her pen at a cloudy curved line. That's your fallopian tube. But where is your ovary? It must be hiding behind your uterus. And see the other one? The other tube is like a slinky. My husband looks at me like he's afraid I might faint. Instead, I bow my head to suppress a chuckle. Leave it to the fertility doctor to discover what I had long suspected. Something was amiss in my womb. I smile because it's amusing to learn there is so much interesting activity down there. The fallopian tubes contorting like acrobats, the ovaries and the uterus playing hide and seek. I'm entertained by the thought of my reproductive organs performing a three ring circus. Since that area of my body, 
the life-giving viscera, the motherly matrix of me has always felt comatose, near dead. I'll pass it on to Sunu. Thank you, so beautiful. Um, I, we are doing this panel um, in really just the few days after the, the court's decision in Dobbs and overturning Roe. And so I actually picked a poem, a short poem. I'm gonna read two short poems. One is called Rebuilding Efforts. Rebuilding Efforts. I wore a black Kurtha shirt with blue jeans and black boots. I wore no jewelry. It was the first time I had ventured into social after all that solitude. I had wanted to talk to no one, just wanted to sit by Shalini. And so I sat and breathed in three times for each in breath. The dancers fused the modern with the classical Indian and I was distracted by a few moments of color, movement after so much sitting at home. I avoided speaking to everyone but the lead dancer's mother visiting from Arizona. Is this how the first outing felt for you? The first after a death, job loss, breakup, or your own specific kind of despair? When did NYC begin again after 9-11? Do you remember what you wore on that night? I decided to read that poem because I think many of us are still in a state of like shock and mourning together. And I think for many of us, it may trigger or remind us of other moments. And this poem was actually after many, many years of, of miscarriages and fertility struggles. And so it was one rebuilding and we will all go through so many. And if we're lucky, we'll have community. And the, the second poem is also um, Things I Didn't Know I Loved. The stack of books always staring me down. Watching the children's movie, not once, but twice. An ex-friend reaching out, even though we will not connect. The memory of Sapna on top of the sadness. Watching the evening world news with my daughter. Her crush on the anchorman. Routinely wearing pajama bottoms for big meetings during the pandemic. Tennis drills outside at age 48. Age 48. Middle management. Pistachio ice cream. Glitter nail polish, but only if the glitter is gold. Kritika's borrowed choker necklace to go with the salvar kameez. Quarantine. Chatting with Jeffrey all night long after borrowing his 10 CDs. Still holding on to my many cousins who missed my wedding. The garden in Fort Greene, planting flowers, learning about mulch from Oza. Chatting in the basement, doing laundry side by side with that landlord's wife. The coffee shop in Brooklyn, the one that never had the things I wanted from its menu. Thank you. Pass it to Lauren. Thank you, Sunu and Jen. Um, so uh, for a little context, my book is a personal growth how-to book. Um, and this is excerpted from the intro. As a self-defense teacher, I can teach you all the verbal skills like boundary setting and assertiveness. And I can teach you all the physical skills in case you need to hit someone in a worst case scenario. But if when you go to use a skill, you hear voices in your head saying things like, I shouldn't be rude. I don't wanna make a scene. I don't wanna hurt their feelings. I need them to like me. If I push back, they'll just write me off as an angry black woman. If you hear voices in your head that say things like that, you won't use the skills or it'll be very difficult to use those skills. That is part of the damage that patriarchy has done to us. Get Empowered, that's the name of the book, 
Get Empowered will help you dismantle your internal barriers to resisting, to speaking up, to protecting yourself. You're probably asking, why should I have to do this? Why shouldn't men who commit the most gender-based violence be responsible for changing the world? I say, good point. But those of us who, tar who are targeted for gender-based, racist, or other oppression-based violence shouldn't have to sit around waiting for the world to change. We shouldn't say, oh, until the men get it together, like we're okay with all the violence being done to us. We can take action on our own behalf while we live in the world as it is now. That's what we call the self-defense paragraph paradox. That's what we call the self-defense paradox. Aggressors alone are 100% responsible for the harassment, abuse, and assault they carry out. There's nothing anyone could do or not do that would make them deserve to be assaulted. At the same time, those of us at risk of identity-based violence can take action to increase our own safety. Doing this work won't guarantee that you'll never be targeted or treated disrespectfully, but we can build our toolboxes for resisting. We can heal the harm we've experienced. We can ditch the shame and self-blame. We can recognize who's responsible and hold them accountable. We can claim our power, claim ourselves and our lives. Lauren, Jen, Sunny, thank you so much for your readings. Um, also just want to shout out as someone who has taken a uh, Defend Yourself class that Laura is one of Lauren's organization, uh, one of Lauren's many organizations. <laughs> um, uh, I can say that it has been tra already transformative and it was just one class. Um, and I think reading any of these, uh, any of our panelists work is going to be part of this transformative experience. Um, and so I wanna open the space now for your voices uh, to really go through and discuss with us um, kind of three different sections of the experience of writing um, the seeds of the books, you know, moving them into, um, moving them into, I guess, the publication process, and then the completion process as well. And so the three kind of areas that we'll be talking about are history of your work, history of your ideas and your processes. Um, and then we'll move into uh, kind of the element of surprise within that time frame. Um, and then we will kind of close our discussion with wisdom, um, but although wisdom is a thread throughout what we'll all be talking about. Um, so give me one moment to do a tech thing and share my screen again. Um, and I would love um, if y'all could let me know when you can see my screen. Can you see it now? Beautiful, all right. And how about now? <laughs> Thank you, <laughs> awesome. So we're gonna begin um, with this kind of framing area of history. So we have three questions that we'll be exploring today. Um, how long were you working on your books? What iterations did they go through before they crystallized into the version that you have now? What kind of support was important for you to have along the way? And how did your book deal come about? Um, what felt like a slog and what felt like a specific kind of alignment and series of, kind of magical events? Um, and I want to start with Jen, actually. Would you start us off in kind of working through this history and then pass it along to another panelist? Yes, absolutely. So thank you for these questions, Johnny. I think they're all really great. And um, I can start by sharing that my book process has felt very long. <laughs> it's been eight years since I came up with the idea. I can remember that because I basically started working on it when uh, my first and only child was born. So uh, this book gestation process is, is it's, it's growing as he, as he grows. So eight years from the idea to then starting to write it um, about three years later. Um, and that was as my MFA thesis. So I basically had probably the draft of what became half of the manuscript 
uh, about three years in. And then based on that draft, I actually did a proposal. <laughs> so, you know, I think a lot of people ask for nonfiction books, you know, do you do a proposal or do you uh, just do the whole thing and then send in the manuscript when you want to pitch agents and when you want to um, go on submission to pub publishers? And honestly, the answer is it depends. <laughs> and um, not on purpose, I kind of went through all the iterations. <laughs> I had a full draft first, and then I did a book proposal. And um, then I did a second book proposal that was radically different from the first book proposal. And this, by the way, was already about seven years into the process. And it was um, through that second book proposal that I got a deal. And so since that book proposal, I've been writing like mad <laughs> to try to actually finish what would be kind of in some ways the second full version of the book, but in other ways, like the, the thousandth and second full version of the book, if you count all the revisions along the way. Um, so crystallized, mm, I'm still waiting for it to crystallize. <laughs> and Lauren and I were having this conversation before we got onto the recording about um, when do you really ever feel like it's done? Uh, and I, you know, am in the home stretch of, you know, the official process, my manuscript is due in October of this year. And um, I definitely feel like it's taking more and more shape. Uh, we'll see when I turn it in, if I actually feel like it's crystallized or not. Uh, the, the other thing I'll say before passing it on is that along the way in those eight years, the amount of support that I've had has been gargantuan and tremendous. And uh, uh, just has made all the difference between me being able to finish this process and me uh, giving up several times <laughs> along the way. And my acknowledgement section is going to be book length. <laughs> I mean, it should be if I really was doing justice to everybody who supported me. Uh, because, you know, people always say, oh, writing is solitary, but it takes lots of people to write a book. Well, I will tell you that it, it, it took like, not just a village, probably like an entire, you know, hemisphere, I feel like, to support me through this. And to be a bit more concrete about that, um, you know, I um, relied a lot on friends who were turned into editors, friends who were turned into emotional support people, but also formal support uh, groups or institutions like the Unicorn Club. Uh, there were several very bumpy parts in my um, process of writing the book proposal that I don't think I would have gotten through without Mino's coaching, without the co-writing sessions that Johnny was moderating and that Lauren and Sunu were part of and other unicorns were part of. Uh, they just, the, the feedback, advice, and also emotional support from groups like Unicorn Club. And also I have several writing, writing groups that I'm part of, informal writing groups. Um, that have been absolutely necessary to keep me going. And for anybody who's writing memoir or poetry that's very personal, uh, I would just absolutely advocate for, if you don't already have this, um, allowing yourself to have the emotional, spiritual, uh, and uh, personal support that you need to be able to excavate those stories and share them. Um, I absolutely needed to have therapy and also some spiritual support and spiritual guidance along the way. Um, and, you know, we deserve, we deserve that, especially when we're, you know, um, I think like basically opening our veins <laughs> and sharing our blood with people on the page. So I'll leave it at that. How about Sunu? You want to weigh in? Yes, yes, uh, definitely resonating with um, the ways that community has been crucial for putting this book together, starting with, I put a book together, um, which is a question I asked myself a lot and wasn't always sure why. And it was so important to have people around me to tell me that my voice was important, my stories mattered, and that they would provide community to others. 
And that's pretty much what motivated me. Um, you know, poetry is its own, its own special area. And it's often, um, you know, people, many, many people write poems, but to think about, you know, putting them out into the world so that other people can read them, not just the people you know, is a big decision. Um, particularly if they are personal in nature. So, you know, to go back to think about the history, I received my MFA several years ago. And so many of these poems were written through that process. Some were written before that. Some were written quite recently in the beginning stages of the pandemic. And it was so important to have the unicorn authors for emotional support for sure, but also just for conversations around how do you figure out what order makes sense or which poems work well near each other, or even the first question of which of these hundred poems should even be in a book? Um, and how do you go about the selecting of that if you don't just have one theme or one story to tell? And so Mina was incredibly important, um, helpful. And those conversations were very, very important, those coaching sessions that were mentioned. Um, and in terms of other support, just having poet friends and writer friends inside and outside of the Unicorn Authors who encouraged me. And to Jen's question about sort of family and personal nature of some of the work, um, I was very nervous about that and continue to be, but it was helpful to just have community around that process and not feeling like you need to have all of those questions answered before you put things together into a manuscript. But because you can make some decisions along the way. And if you're writing about, you know, family members or, you know, we have a child and some of the poems relate to her. And I really wanted to be able to talk to her about some of those pieces, but I also didn't need to do that so early on. At this point I have, because the book is gonna be out next year. And so, Sometimes you can't imagine all of the steps of the process, but something is driving you forward. And I think having a community will help you to, to take those next best steps that you want to take. Um, I can talk about um, the book deal in, in one of these questions. I like this question, which, which parts felt like a slog and which parts felt like magic. Um, I definitely felt like it was a slog to figure out which poems, what the ordering is, and to sort of have them coalesce into one thing that felt very difficult to make those choices. For me, um, the magical part was, you know, soon after I selected a couple of presses and sent it out, I was selected. And I know that is quite unusual. And I feel very lucky and grateful for that because I know there are poets and, and writers who sort of send their stuff out to contests and are finalists for many, many years, which is a great honor and sort of keep at it. And I also, Heard someone recently say she got her first book right away, and then it was 12 years before she had her second book of poems. So, as you know, to Lauren's point, like when are when are you done? When are you all set? It's like if you have a passion for this and you want to keep doing it, then keep doing it and the path will, will open and opportunities and interesting um sort of ways to share your work, whether or not it's through publication, it could be through cultural events, it could be through pride events, it could be in any host of ways, it could be in a newspaper. So there's so many ways that we can share our work with each other and that's actually what it's about versus sort of this book form. But if, if having a book is of interest and that's why you're in this panel, I would say definitely pursue it and do it with community. And I'll pass it to Lauren. Thank you. Um, so, so many different topics within this topic. Um, I, I'm going to uh, um, jump off of what Jen said about like my acknowledgement section will be book length. Um, I've been keeping a list and, you know, um, the unicorns are, of course, key. Um, and I and, you know, for people who aren't familiar with the unicorns, it's it's a very different model than most writing groups. We don't share work and critique it. Um, and really for me, just the 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 being in community and um and and having some kind of accountability, like, oh, I have a time and a and a, a date and a time that I, I show up for 
and actually I, I there's like a bunch of those every week <laughs> um uh really made a huge difference for me but you know thinking about all the people who supported me in all the ways years before i ever got to the unicorns um you know from everybody who ever sat down and co-wrote with me you know like a friend who was working on their phd thesis and i or whatever um uh, you know everybody who ever brought me a meal everybody who put up with the fact that i was inaccessible for a year um <laughs> uh I mean, it really is an astonishing thing. You know, all people who read the book, um, I had, you know, in the final stage, I had 12 readers who, who read the whole thing and gave me feedback. And it, and it wasn't a small thing to read the whole thing. It was 66,000 words. So, it, you know, it's really asking a lot of people. Um, uh, I think the, the thing, one of the things that I, um treasure the most about the unicorns and i felt like i could sink in and like sit back in my chair and relax was the fact that it um you know it was such a queer friendly feminist bipoc centered space um you know so i wasn't guarding against who was going to say something that was going to make me feel uncomfortable or unwelcome or um you know, even though um, there weren't a lot of people doing the kind of writing I was doing, um, it still felt like my people, um, you know, writing wise. Um, the, the other thing I want to say about the the deal, um, so I did write a book proposal. It took me many years because I was overwhelmed anxious and avoidant um i would get stuck on something and like step away and not pick it up again um uh so it took me a long time but by the time i finally got it together i um uh i started submitting i just started looking for agents who do personal growth and self-help um and then hopefully if they you know, had, if they had handled anything that was progressive or feminist or had a BIPOC orientation or whatever, then they would rise to the top of my list. Um, and, you know, I knew from, mostly from being in the binder groups on Facebook, I don't know if people are familiar with the binder groups on Facebook, but, um, you know, I knew people had submitted hundreds of times and never gotten an agent or sometimes never even gotten a nibble so i was prepared for it to be very very grueling and i submitted to about 25 or 30 people and i got one nibble and honestly she was not from one of the agencies that i thought was most aligned with the book um uh but she was so excited about the book. And I thought that counts for everything, right? Um, she got it, she got what it was about. She went and she showed it to a bunch of other women. The book is not just for women, but um, for anybody targeted by, for gender-based violence or, or, or oppression-based violence of any kind. But she, you know, literary agents are primarily cis women. Um, she went and showed it to other people in her office and came back telling me that people were crying reading the proposal so i was like that kind of enthusiasm is worth a lot because she, you know she, it's her job to shop the book um so um so that felt pretty magical that it happened you know pretty fast um and then she submitted to i think 13 publishers and um only got one interest but it turned out to be from the biggest publisher in the world so like no complaints um <laughs> because you know they have reach and influence and can do right by the book so i just feel so amazed that's the magical part i mean those two things the story with the agent and the story with the publisher they're both magical to me um and you know i just feel so happy that it will be out there and so accessible 
to so many people because I got this agent and this publisher. Um, that That's all I want is for people to be able to have access to it. So it makes me very happy. That feels like something that y'all shared collectively to me feels like the slog is weirdly the magic it's in this like strange way, like like the the kind of, like Lauren, you were saying, you submitted to 25 agents. Like that's actually pretty, that feels very much like um, submitting manuscripts, applying for grad school. Like you just like, woof, you send the whole thing out. And it's like, when someone, someone has heard that call that your language is reaching for, someone grips the hand and that is like, what makes all the difference because then it can be shared and all of that can just like concentric out and flow out. Um, but it really does feel like that the kind of efforting really is so a part of that magic at the same time and how we grow through that slog and through that effort. Um, it's, it's in a certain way, so much of that work is like internal, which I think is kind of part of this next question that um, I want to kind of move into, which is um, the elements of surprise. And I think, um, you know, we can talk a little bit, these are huge questions in a certain way. So, um, and I, I also want to be mindful of our time. We have one more uh, space of questioning after this. Um, but the questions that we have here around surprise are, what surprised you about working on your book through the pandemic within the context of a community of other anti-racist pro-social justice authors committed to finishing their books? Which I think you all touched on a bit um, in the last question. Um, so maybe uh, related to that, but, um, but more kind of centering on the second question and discuss what do you wish you'd known at the beginning of your book writing process? Um, I'm thinking about the magic and the efforting and um, those alignments, but um, I'm curious, I'm wondering if um, Sunu, if you wanna start us off. Yeah, it's, there's, so, um, there's so many pieces to the puzzle, I would say. And one thing that surprised me was the length of time and the number of steps because um, I won a contest a year ago now, it was last spring, and the book is not going to be out into the world until next March. March 28 is the publication date. And so it's literally a two-year process for Regal House Press. And they have a very coordinated and organized system. I've been really impressed with this indie press. Um, and there's many, many stages. And, you know, there's the sort of having an editor look at it and for, for they don't do much by way of editing for poets, but there's still sort of technical pieces. And the thing that really surprised me, which is super technical, is that sometimes the poems won't fit on the page in terms of the line breaks. And so you have to make really tough choices about, do you want all these lines to be then indented? Do you wanna create different line breaks? Do you want some of them to be prose poems? So just the mechanics, of going from writing on eight and a half by 11 paper that many of us write on to the size of a book. And the importance of those line breaks in poetry is something that I had never really crossed my mind about the differences there. Um, and so there's really technical stuff that I wasn't ready for that sort of meant um, sort of quick turning around or decisions about how do you wanna handle certain things. Um, and you know, as with many publishers, the cover is a is a it can be really a wonderful or difficult moment because from I think for most publishers, definitely for mine, that is a decision that the publisher retains. But I was really happy that Regal really wanted my input, and we ended up you know figuring out something that I'm very excited about um, with a South Asian woman artist. So. That was also a really wonderful piece to it. And I'll pass it to Jen. I also wish that I had known how long everything would take at the beginning. Uh, I think in my, my uh, social justice work that I do, even though we all know that the long arc of change is very spirally, 
I think I thought that, you know, with writing a book, it was going to be much more linear. <laughs> and um, it is also very spirally <laughs> uh, to write a book. And I wish I would just known that from the beginning, because I think it would have saved me a lot of stress. It would have lifted some of the expectations off of myself that I put on myself to just kind of get it right after I put in a certain amount of work. Um, so iteration, uh, wish I had just kind of like started out with that being the, the mode, like this, everything will be iterated on. <laughs> and that is progress. It's like a drill, um, you know, like a screw or turn slowly turn in a screw. Um, sometimes you got to take it back out to make sure you're doing, doing it the right way, you know? So, so there's a lot of that. Um, and um, a lot of honestly destroying to be able to create again. <laughs> and, um, and uh, you know, I think just if I'd had those expectations to begin with, every time that I had to dismantle something or felt like starting anew, I think I would have just been like, well, this is part of the process as opposed to, oh, I'm failing here. You know, I, everything I did before that is now getting dismantled and reconstructed was a waste and, and it's not, it's just um, all part of a, uh, you know, maybe more of a snail's pace process than, than, you know, a rabbit race that, that I thought I was getting myself into. So um, so I'm trying to soak in it now, right? Like that's a surprise, trying to soak in it. Um, and, you know, I'll say also that um, I'm a very anti-routine person. So I've never been, and I never will be the type of person that's like, I get up and I write from six in the morning to 8 a.m., you know, and then again from nine to 12 p.m. Like even just saying that makes me, makes me agitated. <laughs> I just, just like routine. And yet I was surprised at how much the structure of, uh, you know, what, like what was provided through Unicorn was absolutely necessary for me. Uh, so, you know, I went from writing almost nothing um, creatively during 2020 um, because of 2020 <laughs> uh, coronavirus and the elections uh, and being so absorbed with work to then starting the Unicorn Club and being able, I found, to actually um, not substitute, but kind of um, transition into uh, a writing process that had a similar type of rigor to my work process. And I was surprised by how much I needed that. And, um, and also by how much uh, video conferencing became my best friend. I mean, you know, doing writing sessions with people, just being able to see them on the screen. <laughs> I didn't think that was going to be that helpful, but it actually was helpful. We're on mute for like an hour and I'm like, this is fantastic. <laughs> um, it, the difference between having someone, you know, having your faces on the other side of the screen and writing versus having nobody in the room or on the screen with me and writing um, has been huge. And just the knowing that there is somebody on the other side that's also wrestling with <laughs> words um, has been motivating and has been, you know, provided a sense of solidarity that uh, that's helped me get to this point. What do you think, Lauren? I, I really want to echo that last thing, like, you know, just just having, you know, it's, it's not even accountability because we don't, in unicorns, we don't hold each other accountable, but just having other people to show up for um, and with um, made a huge difference. Um, and, you know, the fact that there were other people on the screen and sometimes I would go and there would not be other people on the screen. And yet still, because it was a scheduled time, I did it, um, you know, so it was very interesting. Another interesting, wrinkle was uh, and a friend pointed this out to me part way through is like if so I had a very tight deadline for my book and um you know it meant that basically the way I made it work for me and everybody is different but the way I made it work for me was like I could do my work work I could do my writing stuff but anything else besides like sleep, eat, brush my teeth, um, 
I couldn't do unless it was walking because I needed to move. So if like anybody who wanted to have a conversation with me or visit or whatever, they had to be willing to go on a walk with me. Um, and, um, and a friend pointed out to me partway through the year, like if you're ever gonna be like trapped inside a book writing process or any kind of, you know, intensive like this, like the pandemic was a good time to do it because I wasn't missing a lot. Um, you know, I wasn't missing gatherings and theater and movies and restaurants and whatever else I might have been doing had we not had a pandemic. So um, that put a nice uh, frame on it for me uh, of like, oh yeah, I can just stay home. This feels like a really perfect um, kind of segue into advice and wisdom, actually, um, a little bit, which is our third framing question. Um, and for the kind of, uh, just for timing's sake, I'm wondering if we can speak, um, since we've really shared a lot about support, um, the emotional journey of, of how we reach out to people, um, what kind of boundaries we put around our time, um, and our emotional needs. We've kind of talked a lot about that through this panel. So I'm wondering if we can kind of center um, this conversation on the second question here, which is that two of you do have agents um, and what advice do you have for authors who may uh, be just entering the writer agent relationship? And Sunu, I wanna also um, kind of invite you into this conversation too around, you know, what's, what's kind of, what are you feeling like in your relationship with the press? Um, what, uh, what kind of experience, what wisdom do you have to share around that? But let's start, Lauren, um, with you, and then maybe we can say, Lauren, Jen, and Sunu, and then we will begin to close together. Well, I can save time by saying, I'm not sure that I have anything to offer on this. I mean, just, I mean, for me, just treating my agent as a knowledgeable person and not some magic, you know, power wielding, um, you know, my, as my partner in this process, somebody else who believed in the book. Um, uh, yeah, that's the only thing I would have to say. I'll say um, that I echo that. And that's something that I actually did have to wrestle with is um, sort of my own agency within the writer agent relationship. Um, because I have an amazing, wonderful agent who's incredibly brilliant. And I thought anything that she said had to go. I mean, obviously what she said had to, had to be right. And often it was. <laughs> um, but then I also had to have conversations with people around, well, if there's certain things that don't resonate with you, you can and should discuss it, at least bring it up. Um, so that was actually another surprise is that I don't generally feel like I'm somebody who um, will just sort of, because of positional power, be like, okay, whatever you say. <laughs> but because of doubts, you know, that I think many of us, especially who are people of color, um, you know, women or um, non-binary identified, um, have internalized sort of messages of, about imposter syndrome, right? Um, it, I, 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 you know, definitely um, carried those into that relationship, and um, had to had to wrestle with them, and um, had to kind of um, tease out as as I went through revisions on the book proposal, you know, what is actually serving the project and what is maybe you know what is what what is an area where I could actually show up more for myself. Um, and just another couple things about the actual process of finding an agent. Um, so, you know, in my experience, um, pitching 25 and getting an agent is like really, really great. <laughs> and, um, you know, so for example, I, I pitched 60, uh, give or take 60. Um, and, you know, out of that 60, you talk to about six. And that also is a pretty high sort of rate of return. Um, you know, I know people who pitched 100 or more. And um, so casting a wide net 
uh, is important and it can be a grueling, it can be a grueling process. The way that I treated it was just when I felt like I had no creative bones left in my body, <laughs> I would just kind of do like maybe 30 minutes of agent research um, through databases online. There's free stuff you can find online, but then also looking at books that were similar to what I wanted to write and finding out from their acknowledgements pages or from Googling the authors um, who represented those authors. And then I would add those agents to my list. Um, and then beyond that, it's um, really tailoring, you know, not treating it as an e-blast, but tailoring each pitch to each agent. Hey, you represent this author, or I noticed that, you know, you just represented this new book that came out that I read and loved, you know, or, you know, whatever it may be um, that made you put them on their list. Letting them know that makes a big difference. Um, yeah, that's it. See you Um, the theme that I'm, that I'm getting from both of you and that I will also share under the wisdom bullet is the hustle, the actual hustle that it takes. And to, to keep that hustle going takes a, an incredible amount of passion and persistence and belief in your own work. And I think that ties very much to the emotional journey because you sort of have to reach a place where you believe I do have something to say and it is helpful to the world or interesting to others. And so I want it to be out there. But then once you have a publisher or an agent, it doesn't end. And particularly if you're with a smaller press, there's then hustle in terms of connecting with bookstores or talking about readings or all of the steps that it takes to once a book is in the world to let people know that it's there. And so, which is a different kind of energy than writing poetry. It, it's very different, but it does take all of that together. And you can also hire public publicity people if you have the funds for that, or you know, talk to folks who may do some of that pro bono. But there's an incredible amount of hustle involved, as you've heard from Jen and Lauren, about getting your work into the world after the creative part is done. And I think that there's a lot of um, resources available online and otherwise to help you do that, but it is a big part of the project as well for many of us. Mm, I'm so happy that you spoke to that, the kind of after, <laughs> the after effects of, of the afterglow is still is still work is still a hustle and it's so built on continuing relationships like continuing to to advance relationships and connection I think um, has been that that's been definitely my process with my book also um, there's uh, the indie press that my book is with is like so amazing and also um, we definitely needed to collaborate. We needed to become collaborators in um, in sharing the work um, with bookstores, um, with other writers who maybe we wanted to take readings with. Um, and so I think something else that y'all have all touched on is that collaborative energy. And and for me, and, and um, this will be like the last thing that I say, um, which is like, for me, I feel like that, that collaborative energy kind of helps, it, it becomes its own resource. I feel like I'm resourced by the relationships that we continue to kind of build and grow and also kind of seeing my community members, the three of you, um, doing such amazing work in the world and continuing to be agents in your own book process um, and also continuing to like do this amazing social justice work. I feel like I feel like I can continue the path to putting this writing into the world and believing in it because of that kind of like kinetic energy. Um, so that I just want to give y'all a shout out <laughs> for, for this amazing wisdom and, and this deeply enriching conversation today. Um, we're at the point of closing. Um, 
And so this is kind of our closing page. I want to just say thank you so, so much, Lauren, Jen, Sunu, for joining today and for sharing your words, your time with us. Um, it's a joy and a pleasure as always to be with you in conversation and to hear your experiences um, and share in this courageous community with all of you. Thank you so much for all of your time and for sharing your magic with us. Um, before we sign off, um, I want to invite you to um, follow this link on the page, maybe take a screenshot of this page in particular, the share screen. Um, the final kind of resource that we uh, at Unicorn Authors Club want to share um, is a publishing primer. So it has kind of, it's a PDF and it's basically a download of a lot of the things that you've heard today, step-by-step um, -step information about book proposals, about finding agents, um, and a lot of the other pieces um, that we discussed today. Um, so you can follow this link. It's https colon forward slash forward slash bit dot ly forward slash 1455 unicorn. Um, so again, definitely take a screenshot of this page um, if you want to remember the link, but you can always email us at hello at unicornhunters.club um, and we'll give you this link. <laughs> um, and also want to um, invite y'all to connect with our panelists on social media, follow what they're up to, get hype about their books, <laughs> um, definitely put them on your, on your to purchase pre-order lists. Um, these are books that I personally am going to just cherish having in my library and I know I will be returning to again and again when I need a hand to hold in this chaotic, kind of terrible um, world. Um, but I look to all of you for inspiration and care in that space. Um, so again, um, before we close, um, I wanna just share when you do type in this link for the publishing primer, it will um, ask, the page will ask you to enter your email address. If you all are like, what is this link? What's happening? You'll be asked to enter your email address and for full disclosure, it will sign you up to the very occasional Unicorn Authors Club newsletter um, before you're redirected to getting the publishing primer download. Just wanted to give you all heads up about what's to come when you enter the URL. Um, so again, thank you all so much, Lauren, Jen, Sunu. Um, any final words before we close? Thank you so much for um, making this happen, Johnny, and for including me. Yeah, I echo the thanks and gratitude and echo what Jen said about sort of speak up about your voice in the process and your thoughts about what your book needs to be, because I've also had those experiences work out surprisingly when I when I did that. So I wanted to plus one that. And, and I'll just add that um, we need everybody's stories. So um, no scarcity models around storytelling. <laughs> we need all your stories. And um, Johnny, I also wanted to say thank you and also um, prop up Johnny's book that you can find and it's out and about. And I'm glad you talked a little bit about your process as well. Thank you all so much. Um, all right, we'll be ending the recording now. Um, hope you all who are watching have a beautiful rest of your days or your evenings, whatever time zone you're